Okay, welcome to another exciting edition of News Generation. I do hope you've had a great week so far. My name is Faustina Safo, and coming up, we dig deep into the meaning of some of the most familiar Ghanaian names. And the school in the Upper East region where children are struggling to access secular education. Plus, we'll tell you about the kids helping other kids gather shoes to wear. You don't want to miss any of this. You're watching News Generation. Please stay. You can join our conversations online. Find us on Facebook at News Generation GH and on Twitter at News Gen GH. Now to our first story. Our names identify us and make us unique. Some names are given due to the circumstances during the childbirth. Others are given because of the family affiliation or the day on which a person is born. Our reporter, Dr. Zbedu, visited St. Teresa's school to find out why some pupils bear the names they have and has come through with this report. We have she -hole. Sometimes you hear people feel referred to as she -hole. Traditional African names often have unique stories behind them. From the day or time a baby is born to the circumstances surrounding the birth, several factors influence the names parents choose for their children. Whichever ethnic group you look at, these local names reveal a wealth of information about the bearer. Some names reflect the mood or circumstance of the family at the time of birth. Some of them serve as warnings or rebukes. To show that a child was unplanned for because the parent had decided not to give birth again, in our land, a child will be named Melevivio, which translates as non-necessary. 11-year-old class 6 pupil of the St. Theresa School, Mami Esikum, bears the surname Enyimayel, which translates, you didn't praise me. She tells the story behind the name. My name is Mami Esikum Enyimayel. The Enyimayo in my name means, you didn't praise me. It was, my mother told me it was given to me by she, both she and my father, but before that there were times that she had troubles in, in the family with my father. And um, those times my father used to leave her. He goes out, but he, the time he comes home, it's very late, and the, the work he does, she didn't even know about it, but he said he was working. So those times, I was very little. She told me I was about a month or two, and he didn't bring money to the house or food on the table. She was the one who, in her hard work, got the money to buy the foodstuffs and things that we needed in the house. And when she asked him for money, every time, all that he said is, I don't have any. But he goes out claiming that he, he is going to work to come. But when he comes back, he doesn't bring any money onto the table. So even she has to supply money for him, for him to go out to do what he wants to go and do. And she told me that there were times when she asked him to come and look after me in the house, but he told her that he was busy. She asked him what was he doing, but she didn't, he didn't tell her what, what he was actually doing. So when, now that I've grown up, she told me some, some things about him, which, she said, which I've just said, but I was not happy about it, but I've seen him before, and I can recognize him anyway. Nigel Selassie Nanakofi Hotto equally has a story. My full name is Nigel Selassie Nanakufi Hoto. The name Nigel means the champion for Christ because my parents expected me to be better and, than them and also live up to my name. Selassie means that God has heard because when I was in my mother's room, they were, they were praying for a fir the first child to be a son. So when they got me, they actually named me Selassie. I was named Nan Kofi because I was the male child and I was born on Friday. My name Hotel means house owner or rich man. Um, Hotel is a family name because I had one. I once had a, an ancestor whose name was Hotel. He was a very rich man and didn't know how to pass on his riches, so. He went to buy glasses, the local glasses, 
and every time he slept, he would put the glasses on the table. And whilst his servants found him, he would tell them, if I sleep, don't think I'm not watching you. So he would put the glasses on the table and sleep. Once no servants was in the room and he woke up during the night, when he saw that no one was there, he called them and, and almost sacked all of them, but they begged for forgiveness. So every time he put the glasses there, they even work harder than they do when his eyes are open. And that's why I was named Hutton. It has been in the family from, for generations. Many thought she could not survive beyond the first month, but her parent did not give up on her. Many high, interpreting, not lazy or not giving up, is 11 years old and tells why she was given this name. My name is Mini High Alatiana. When I was being given birth to, I was pale. So my parents thought I won't survive, but then I survived. So they gave me the name Mini High. One day when I came home from school with my friends, they heard my mom calling me Mini High. So they were making mockery of me because they said that name was very strange. So then I went to ask my mom why she gave me that name. And she said that when they gave birth to me, I was pale. And for about six months, I was still pale. So they were taking me to the hospital. They, they would discharge me, taking me, discharging me. Because my parents didn't give up on me. So they said that if they gave up on me, they would, they would be scared that they would have lost if they me. Gave up on you, you would have died. So then that's why they gave me the name Mini High. Fifi Asari Sapon. The three subject teacher says Akan's names develop their meaning from the appellation. Now when you look at the uh, family names, which are the real Akan names, you have names that names like Opoku, Asare, Obin, uh, Ajay, Dankwa, Ofori, and a, a, a lot of them. But one thing about it is that those names don't have meanings. We don't attach any meanings to them, but they have appellations. Huh. Name like Asare. Asare has Asalbidiakon or Asalbafo as the appellation. Usu Chan also has the appellation. The, the Usu, yeah, the name is Usu, but the Chan is the appellation. Um, Safo is also one Akan name, and the appellation is Kantanka, and a, a, a lot of them. See. And they, they derive their meanings from the appellations. So Safo, for instance, has the uh, Kantanka as the appellation. That shows greatness, talks about greatness. Bidiyako, which is the appellation for Asare, talks about bravery. How? You are, you are compact, ready, uh, compact, ready. Shows how ready you are to fight, and, and that's how it is. Grace Latte is a gun teacher at the school. Those who are believed to come back after they die, they come back. The names, some of the names are, they don't give them proper names. Some names like Achafu, Boba, Boya, and the rest. These names are given to them. They believe that when they give them such names, when they go, they will not, um, they will not die again. They will stay. Mm -hmm. And then also, they don't treat them well. They don't take very good care of them because they don't want them to die. However, even before parents select a name for their child, the baby already has a name. Among some Ghanaian ethnic groups like the Akan, Ga, Ewe, and Nzema, a name is automatically assigned based on the day the child is born. These day names correspond to the day of the week someone is born, and so by default, everybody has one. So if next you come across Achu and Achupi, know that Achu is the eldest. For News Generation, Dokas Buedu reports. Well, now you know the meaning of some of those names that you have, and probably you don't know 
what it is about. So now moving on, in parts of Ghana, children could stay away from school for lack of shoes. Now, as insignificant as it sounds, this problem is part of the reasons for increasing level of student absenteeism. But a group of pupils at the International Community School in Kumasi are helping make change, donating shoes to other pupils of their age in less privileged schools. Here's a report by Justice Beidou. Kids helping kids. These are students of the International Community School. They've come to the Pechi Primary School just a few kilometers outside their own campus. Both schools are in Kumase, capital of the Ashanti region, and yet they look worlds apart. Whereas students of ICS are privileged to have all the basics needed for effective teaching and learning, the Pechi School, which is a government school like many others in Ghana, is woefully under-resourced. We are collaborating with Bright Generation Community Foundation and we are giving, we are giving out terms to the less fortunate to our community school, um, which is Petri School. I feel like we've been sitting here too long and not, being, not doing much because then we are fortunate but we know that people out there aren't. So then we are, I'm motivated because I feel like there is a lot more that we can do to give out to the community and I feel that we should be giving out as much as we can. So. I just want them to have just a taste of what we have. My motivation is inspiration from my dad because since I was a kid he's always been telling me how he didn't have it easy. So he has given me a lot of opportunities and I feel like all those kids out there deserve the same opportunities and I would like to reach out to them. Everyone should be ready to do the best that they can, even if it's very little, because if everybody does little, it's going to turn out very big. So I think that any little thing that you have, you should be ready to share it with someone who also needs it. The inequality seen between these two schools is just an example of the wide gap that still lies between Ghana's haves and the have-nots. This initiative is the idea of the Bright Generation Community Organization. Social entrepreneur Bernice Dapa is its executive director. Um, since 2012, we've donated more than 600,000 pair of shoes across the country, most of the uh, districts and the communities. And the kids are so enthused because most of the kids, students go to school without shoes. And you know, the way the sun is shining, they always get cuts, a lot of infections, which is also distracting the academic performances. So we, 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 we look at how best we can also sustain this project alongside. We're donating books, we're donating pens, we're donating bags to school children. We just want to make sure everything that a, a child or a student needs to make his or her academic performance very outstanding. That is what we are trying to address at the moment. That's why we call it Educational Plus. Everything that's triggered in terms of education to make our kids or the children to become a better person in the near future. Initiatives like what these children are involved in would help, but it would only be for the limited few they are able to reach. The call is for government to do more to help needy pupils everywhere in Ghana. Justice Beidou, News Generation, Kumasi. Well, that's very kind of the students. So you can also do something unique in your community and tell us about it. Remember, you can find us on Facebook at News Generation GH and on Twitter at News Gen GH. Now, to the Upper East region now, stories about the daily struggles of deprived rural children to access education is sometimes mind-boggling. The fate of some pupils of the local Islamic school in a community near Boku in the Upper East region remain somewhat uncertain. This is because decades after it was set up, secular education is yet to be introduced, limiting the scope of study to only the Quran and Arabic. In the following report, Mahmoud Muhammad Nuruddin highlights the plight of these children. This small village, about 25 minutes on a motorbike journey from Boko, is known for its Quranic and Arabic education. There appears, however, to be a cold and silent revolution for secular education to be introduced to complement the instruction currently being offered. 
and it's coming from some of the many Islamic scholars the school has produced. Even without good structures for teaching and learning, agents of change, a youth group, want to break the old tradition. Almost all students attend school barefooted. They have no chairs and tables. Some have to sit on the floor. For more than five decades, children here have been taught this way. They sleep in these structures after the day's lessons, wake up the next morning to another day with its own challenges. We need help. For the sake of Allah, help us with books and other essential materials that will make studies here better. Some people have come in the past, but we are yet to see any help. Here, everything is free. Students are not being charged for their education. Directors and teachers here wish the situation could change for the better. They don't pay anything for whatever service we provide, but challenges are hindering the better service we want to provide. Aminatu Alhaji Mukhtar is one of the 25 female students here. Her desire is to become someone important in future, but there are many challenges. We want philanthropists to support us to become better people in future. Until help comes to these people, they will continue to live in the situation for many years to come. From Boko, this is Mohammed Nuruddin's report for Joy News. Well, the issue of overcrowding in prison has over the years become an issue of concern. A judge in Nigeria's southern Delta state won governors in the country to sign a death row permit to help decongest the ever-growing number of prisons in this, prisoners in the cells. Rather. But international human rights groups strongly disagrees and is calling for the abolition of death penalties. The world is talking about Nigeria. A judge in Nigerian Southern Delta State wants governors in the country to sign warrants for persons on death row. According to Judge Marshall Omukuru, doing so will help decongest Nigerian prisons, which has over 1,600 inmates on death row, according to statistics from the National Human Rights Commission. The judge believes doing so will help deter other people from committing such crimes. This statement he made while delivering a lecture titled The Judiciary and Criminal Justice System at an institution in the city of Ibadan, Nigeria. His position is in sharp contrast to that of international rights groups like Amnesty International who have repeatedly called for the abolition of death penalty. The most recent executions in Nigeria were in the late December 2016 when three prisoners were killed in a dual state. We we'll take this quick break, and when we come back, we have more lined up for you. Please stay. Welcome back from the break. Now, Minister Designate for Information Mustafa Hamid says technology education would be a cornerstone of the new MPP government. Speaking to New Generation at the commissioning of the African Science Academy in Tema this week, Mr. Hamid said this would boost the human resource capacity of the country. Here's the report. According to the minister-designate, institutions such as the African Science Academy should be encouraged hence to promote the technology system in the country. Well, I think that it's a very good initiative. It's unique. It's the first of its kind. Um, I'm not sure about West Africa, but in Ghana here, of course, this is the first exclusively uh, science school for girls. And the fact that girls are being taught 
you know, to be pioneers in science and mathematics is the best thing that can happen to our nation. In the 21st century, science and technology is basically, if you want, the driver of development. The African Science Academy is a new school that opened its doors in August 2016 to its first cohort in 24 exceptional girls from Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, Togo, Ethiopia and Uganda. We look for girls from across Ghana and other countries around Africa, whether it's Nigeria, Uganda, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, and we bring them into the school and they study maths and physics and then they go on to university. So we're very passionate about uh, developing education in the country and we believe that science and maths education is really key and is the bedrock. So we will continue to push it. We will scale up the school to maybe 200 or more students each year and we will reach out to other schools to share with other schools our technique for teaching science and mathematics so that it improves across the country. Some students in the school shared their views on the initiative of the school with News Generation. It has helped me to push beyond my boundaries because, fine, I knew I was a good student before coming here, but now I know that I know a lot more than most of my mates that are even in the university right now. I've learned so much. I've learned to solve problems without giving up until I find the solutions to those problems. And African Science Academy has, always, has also helped me to figure out what I want to do in the future. Now, with days to the election of the 25-member Council of State, a private legal practitioner has suggested the abolition of the institution. Daniel Segorse believes the institution has outlived its relevance. You've been sharing your views with us on WhatsApp. A Council of State is people who give their personal advice and help him rule the country or the nation. Because sometimes the president alone cannot think for the whole nation, so he needs people to guide him in order to make him think better for the nation. Every country needs a council of states. Council of states are very important to every country because they serve as advisors to the president. If a president, we have a president in the country, and the president has no advisory, anyone to advise him, or hey, the president can do anything he or she wants, and which can also lead to bad things that a president can do. I think they are very, very important because the Council of States, when a country has a Council of States, it helps to improve how the, pre the president will govern the country. It helps to improve how the, what the president will plan to do for the country. And it helps to improve how the president will like set up a budget and how to do everything for the country. They are very important. Council of States are the prominent people, the chiefs and then the elders that advise the president. And as the saying goes, two heads are better than one. So it will help develop the nation if there are people like that. Sometimes the president like, will have a lot of problems on the mind and cannot take care of a whole country on his own. So I think the Council of State is very important. And like I think the Council of State serves like a three legged stool. And without them, the stool cannot stand. So I think that's how the Council of State helps. So I think it's very important. People who advise the president on how to manage the country. Sometimes his mind is occupied with family affairs and other affairs. So he would need people who would help him advise the country. Council of States are the elders that help the president and his ministers in their decision making. The president together with his ministers and the executives, they are all under one, one head. But with the help of the Council of Elders, they become two heads and then that makes them <coughs> bring up their views easily and they advise them on certain things to do and certain things not to do. There's more news in International News Round. 
President Robert Mugabe says the vote to readmit Morocco to the African Union shows some African leaders lack principles. Mr. Mugabe said the temptation of Morocco's money had won over their principles. He claims Morocco has been working for quite a long time, building mocks, giving out money to the group, adding the decision comes as a blow to some AU members. Zimbabwe, South Africa, Namibia and Algeria believe that Morocco should have only been readmitted to the AU on condition if it gives up its claim to the Western Sahara Territory. Morocco left the Organization of African Union more than 30 years ago in protest over the decision to grant full right membership to the Palisario Front, which is demanding independence for Western Sahara. Colombia's National Liberation Army rebels have freed a key hostage clearing the way for peace talks with the government next week. Ex-Congressman Odin Sanchez had been held by the army since he offered to swap places with his alien brother in April 2016. President Juan Manuel Santos had insisted that Mr. Sanchez be relieved before peace talks could begin in the town. On Twitter, the army called on the government to free two of its fighters. The ELN, a communist army, has been in conflict with successive Colombian governments since the year 1964. 41 Nigerians have been deported from the United Kingdom. The deportees, made up of 33 males and 8 females, were said to have been leaving illegally in the UK even after their visit had expired. Some lamented they were not given the opportunity to pick up their possession. They arrived at the cargo terminal of Mutala Mohammed International Airport, a Keja Lagos state, in a chartered airplane 330 aircraft which touched ground at about 7.40 a.m. Officials of the National Emergency Management Agency, Nigeria Immigration Service, Nigerian Air Force policemen and the aviation security personnel were on ground to receive and profile the deportees. Well, let's check out other stories making headlines locally in local news round. Officials of the Education Ministry, including the sector's minister, Dr. Matteo Boku Prempe, have been sympathizing with families of the children who were killed when a school building collapsed on them. Claims indicate the school authorities ignored advice to relocate to another structure after they complained about the state of the building. However, the school headmaster says the alternative offered to them was no good. At least six kindergarten pupils were killed in the tragedy in the central region town of Bremajemra. The education minister passed through the town to sympathize with relatives of the deceased. The minister-designate communications, Asla Osu, has assured the appointment committee and the general public that she will be neutral and fair to all telecommunication companies in the country, despite her legal battle with Zane Mobile Communication, now Airtel. When she appeared before the appointment committee, Mrs. Owusu explained she worked for Zane Mobile Communications, now Airtel, in the year 2009 when her appointment was terminated. She mentioned that it was terminated because her public appearance in the media was becoming an embarrassment to the company. She then dragged the company to the Human Rights Court for infringing on her rights. Gospel artist Anita Ifriye alleged the organizers of the annual Vodafone Ghana Music Awards asked her management team to pay an amount of 10,000 Ghana cities if she desires to win an award. Anita hinted that in 2015, when she was nominated in two categories, her management approached the organizers to question them on why she got only two nominations. There, they were asked to allegedly pay bribe in order to win the two categories. She suspects her management refusal to pay the said amount led to her not receiving an award in that year. Her statement comes on the back of the PRO for Chatterhouse and VGMA, Judge Quay's revelation that gospel artists have been making efforts to bribe some members on the Vodafone Ghana Music Award Board. 
personally, I have had fun this week. Remember to join our conversations online at News Generation GH on Facebook and at News Gen GH on Twitter. Now, remember, go on YouTube. Yes, you should be watching our full episode. In case you miss any episode of News Generation, you can find us on YouTube. Just type News Generation and you can watch it. Voila. Well, from myself and my whole crew, I say thank you to you guys. You've been amazing. My name is Faustina Safo. Bye-bye.